What's going on everybody and welcome back to another video. Today we're going to be making up an Oktoberfest for the year. Yes, this is probably very last minute and might potentially be a bit late for most of you guys who are actually brewing Oktoberfest beers for this year. Um, as usual, I was like, ah, yeah, I'm probably not going to do one this year. And then last minute kind of, it just, the stars align and I'm like, all right, I need to make one. Uh, so we're going to make an Oktoberfest for this year. And yes, I could use Lutrik Weig like I've done in the past, or I could use a quick lager method like I use for my New Zealand pills. Um, but really I wanted to do this one as a more traditional lager um, and actually I was originally planning on decoction mashing this one for you guys that's right I was gonna do that however nature and weather had other plans because uh, well that's why I'm inside uh, I only have this day to brew and there's currently tropical storm Lee right outside so I can't really do much about that I can't do that while I'm inside because that involves taking a uh, large container of hot boiling grain and moving it up and down two flights of stairs if I'm brewing inside that's the only way I can decoction mash and I am not doing that so don't worry though there's a decoction mash video in the future with a check logger I've got a good idea of how I'm gonna do that so rest assured we will do a decoction mash at some point in the future we'll see how it impacts things but uh, today's not that day um, I'm gonna attempt to make up for the uh, lack of melanoidin from the base recipe by doing a 90 minute boil so we'll see how that goes today also I'm going to be showing you guys something quite out of the ordinary for me. Um, I am brewing today on a Blickman Brew Easy Compact Surface, uh, which is Blickman Engineering's newest brewing system. This is first and foremost not a review video. I will be doing a review at some point in the future, but it's not today. I got to brew on it first and figure out how I like it. Um, there is no money that changed hands there, though. They just sent me the system, told me to uh, see what I thought about it. So the system's going to be a little bit different than my usual brew day, and also because it's a new system, some variables may be different, some things may be different when it comes to actually brewing the beer. So I'm not quite sure how this is going to turn out, uh, but it should be very interesting. Interesting to find out nonetheless. Don't worry, I'm not gonna stop brewing with the claw hammer system and just exclusively work on this Blickman system now. It's not how that works. I'm hoping to make a point to brew on both systems for an equal amount of time. I know there's plenty of folks out there who use the Brew Easy system or other systems that are like it, um, that are not so similar to the claw hammer system. So hopefully this helps make a little bit more relatable content for you. So I would like to thank Blickman for providing that system and I'm really excited to see what happens with it. We're starting out with five pounds of Vireman floor malted Bohemian pills malt. Uh, the original intention here was to use that malt for the decoction mash because it does benefit from that decoction, um, but we're not going to be doing that today. We'll be doing a step mash. On top of that five pounds of Pilsner malt, we're going to be adding six pounds of Munich malt. This is Vireman Munich 1. Uh, this is a lighter colored Munich malt, again trying to keep that color from getting too dark. Uh, and then lastly, we're going to add one pound and one pound only of Vireman Cara Munich 1. This is a Lighter colored crystal malt, but don't be fooled, it is a uh, very powerful ingredient. It comes in about 40 lava bun, so it does have a significant color contribution, but uh, this is really here to add a little bit of depth and complexity to the beer. We want to do that without adding extra sweetness to the beer, because sweetness in a Oktoberfest lager can be very cloying, and that is not a particularly nice thing. I uh, want to keep it on the lighter side, keep it toasty, keep it um, bready and full and satisfying, uh, with a maybe a little tinge of sweetness on top of it, but really more than anything, this is here to keep the final gravity from just getting too low and getting this beer too dry. Um, so that's really the main point of that. Um, I don't have any extra melanoid malt on hand, otherwise I would have used that to substitute for the decoction, but uh, I have another trick up my sleeve, which we'll explain in a bit here. For hops, uh, relatively simple. We're keeping the IBUs rather low on this one, so I'll be using uh, basically just two ounces of Hallertal Mittelfrühe, which is 2.9% uh, alpha acid in my case. So we're adding one ounce of it as first word hops, which means that it's going in uh, basically as soon as I end the mash, and it will sit in the wort as the wort heats up to a boil and throughout the rest of the boil. And then the other ounce is only going to go in at 10 minutes, uh, just to add a little bit of flavor and aroma, and I think it'll add a nice noble character to the beer. For the water profile on this beer, I'm using a profile that's very similar to the New Zealand Pilsner, except kind of dialed up a little bit. So I basically just kept the ratios even and tried to bump up the calcium content a little bit to help it clarify a bit faster. So that water profile is 50 parts per million of calcium, 
three parts per million of magnesium, 13 parts per million of sodium, 67 parts per million of chloride, 68 parts per million of sulfate, and zero parts per million of bicarbonate. To get that water profile, I'll be starting out with eight gallons of reverse osmosis water for my new RO system, and uh, adding to that three grams of gypsum, one gram of Epsom, one gram of salt, which is sodium chloride, and three grams of calcium chloride. All of that will go into the strike water as it heats up. For the yeast in this one, I brewed Oktoberfest in the past with um, Weiss 2206 Bavarian Lager, with W3470, with Diamond Lager, with Lutrich Weich, um, and I've never actually used a dedicated Oktoberfest yeast to make my Oktoberfest beers, and that changes now. So today, we're gonna be using Weiss 2633, which is their seasonal Oktoberfest blend. So I'm really excited to see how that actually impacts how this beer turns out and how it feels like an Oktoberfest. So I'm hoping that it really gets a nice residual maltiness in there and a little touch of that classic German lager character. I'm hoping it really helps emphasize the caramelization that we're going to try and create in this beer and would otherwise be created uh, if you were doing a decoction mash. So now speaking of the mash, uh, yes, I was planning on doing a decoction mash. We're not doing that because of the weather. So what I have to do is a step mash instead. So I'll be doing a two-step Hochkirch style step mash 30 minute rest at 146 Fahrenheit and a 30 minute rest at 158 Fahrenheit. Uh, this is going to help us get the most we can out of that floor malted Bohemian Pilsner malt and really just unlock a lot of sugars. It also increases the amount of complex sugars that we can generate, uh, which will help in turn make the beer actually have a lot more malt complexity and a little bit more character to that sweetness and slighter, higher final gravity uh, at the very end of the process, if this all goes was right. If I was doing a decoction mash, the plan was to uh, do a single decoction basically to bring us to mash out. Generally the rule of thumb for what decoction mash would look like for this beer, uh, if you want to go that route, and I encourage you to do so if you want to, um, would be to remove 30% by, by volume of the thick mash uh, after you have it uh, mashed in and circulated. Take that and then slowly bring it to a boil over a stable heat source like a gas flame or an electric element. Emphasis on slowly bringing it up to a boil. You would boil the mixture of the thick mash for the entirety of the 30 minutes uh, that your main mash is sitting at 158 Fahrenheit. And then once you reach that mash out time target, go ahead, take your boiling thick mash off of your heat source and return it slowly and gradually into your main mash. This will raise the temperature up to the mash out rest and it will also add a lot of character, color, and um, actually uh, tends to increase one's efficiency quite a bit as well. So um, it's an interesting technique. I recommend you try it if you haven't already. I've got a couple videos already on my channel about decoction, but once again, I promise I will be making a more in-depth video on it in the very near future. But because we can't decoction, we're doing a 90 minute boil. This is just a longer boil, which will condense the word further in. We'll, it will promote um, the Maillard reaction occurring within the boil instead of within the mash. That really brings out a lot of those melanoidins, which is that really nice, rich, malty character you get out of a German lager, because a lot of those breweries do it. So um, that is one way to help uh, negate the effect of not doing a decoction mash or not adding melanoidin malt into the whole thing. Anyway, guys, let's go ahead and cut to the brew day footage now. So I started out by adding eight gallons of reverse osmosis water into my uh, Blickman Brew Easy compact surface and started to heat that up to the mash temperature of 146 for the first rest. While this was going on, I measured out my water salts and I added those into the strike water as it was collecting and heating up. And I also milled out all of my grain and set that to the side. Once my strike water reached that uh, target mash temperature of 146, I added in the grain basket before mashing in. I also made sure that I broke up all the clumps in the mash before setting up the recirculation and uh, adjusting that flow rate, of course, as well through the pump. Once 
Once the mash had recirculated for about 10 minutes, I pulled a pH measurement, found it to be uh, pretty much on target at about 5.13, uh, a little bit on the low side, but that actually helps with loggers, so uh, I'm not too concerned about that. I let everything sit at 146 for 30 minutes, and then the Blickman Brew Commander, because I programmed it in, uh, automatically stepped up to the next rest temperature of 158 Fahrenheit for 30 minutes, and then automatically stepped up to the mash out of 170 for 15 minutes. Once that mash out rest was complete, the timer went off and I removed the grain basket from the system and allowed that to drain for about 15 minutes while I also started to heat everything up to a boil. As I was heating everything up to a boil, I also added in my one ounce of Hallertau Mittelfruhe as first word hops and allowed those to steep in the wort as it heated up. Once I reached the full boil, of course I did nothing at this point and just started the timer on the brew commander for about 50 minutes. Once I reached the 10 minute mark, I added in one more ounce of Hallertau Mittelfruhe, and I also added in a Whirlflock tablet and some yeast nutrient. I let the boil continue for 10 more minutes before I started a whirlpool and allowed all of the trube and other uh, debris inside the kettle to coagulate into a nice tight cone before cooling through my counterflow chiller in a single pass down into my anvil bucket fermenter. Once I collected all the wort in my fermenter, I placed it inside my fermentation chamber and allowed it to continue cooling until it reached about 50 degrees Fahrenheit. At this point, I pitched in my entire one liter starter of Y's 2633 Oktoberfest blend, and then I pulled an original gravity sample and found it to be uh, quite a bit above target at 1060. At the end of the day, that's what a 90 minute boil on a brand new system will do for you though. Regardless, at this point, I capped everything up and left it to ferment. So for the fermentation on this beer, first of all, I made a starter uh, made from two packs of Y-East uh, 2633. So that is important because this is a lager and uh, lagers do demand a higher cell count uh, for a pitch rate than ales do of the same original gravity. Granted, I'm brewing on a new system, so I don't quite know what the efficiencies are gonna look like. So um, I could have a chance of brewing a rather high gravity beer relative to what I had planned. So having that extra yeast in there is really gonna help everybody have a good time. We're we're gonna bring the wort down to 50 degrees uh, before I pitch that yeast, first of all, because I wanna make sure I avoid any pitching related off flavors and I wanna get the yeast a healthy start. 50 degrees for a traditional lager yeast like this one, not a hybrid yeast, um, is going to be right smack in the middle of where it likes to ferment. It'll be low and slow, it'll take its time. This fermentation's not going to be done fast. It will be probably two to three weeks of actual overall fermentation time. If things are going well, I will probably ramp that temperature up slightly. And then of course, once we actually reach the final gravity, I will raise it for a diacetyl rest, which is a traditional step when brewing with traditional lager or yeast. Uh, because the yeast generates a lot of diacetyl, uh, it's always a good idea to do a little bit of a diacetyl rest at the end of the fermentation to help clean it up. Alternatively, you can make use of an enzyme known as ALDC to help get rid of that diacetyl. For alternative yeasts, I've mentioned it several times before, you can use Y-Yeast 2206, you can use uh, W3470, Diamond Lager, Lutrikovic, you can definitely use Nova Lager. Um, there's plenty of other trendy lager yeast that you can use, but honestly, like Oktoberfest really should be made with a Munich lager strain. That's exactly why I'm using this particular lager strain, uh, is because I wanna see if that has a real noticeable difference from using the standard 3470 or diamond lager, something like that. Now, if you don't have the ability to run your fermentation at a lower temperature and keep it steady, I would definitely recommend pressure fermenting this beer um, because that is going to help solve those problems. This is not necessarily an easy thing for most people, but pressure fermentation will help make your beer faster and it will still have that same clean lager character as if it was fermented at a lower temperature. Uh, this has been put to the test many, many times, including on my own channel. So uh, it is a viable method, especially if you don't have temperature control. By the way, once this beer is done uh, fermenting, we're going to go ahead and transfer it to a keg. I will be adding findings to this beer because it's so late in the year, um, so I need to rush that clarifying process and rush that lagering process, and uh, hopefully that works out well, so we'll see. But anyway guys, I'm looking forward to the result in this one, so I'll see you in a few weeks, and until then, cheers. So fermentation for this beer went pretty much exactly as planned. Uh, so it reached the planned final gravity of 1014, which is not too high and not too low, um, in about two weeks of overall fermentation time. 
There weren't really any sort of issues with this. I did end up ramping the temperature uh, over the course of the fermentation. So it finished at about 59 degrees uh, for that fermentation. I added ALDC enzyme as well to the uh, fermentation to prevent diacetyl. And this actually knocked a good week off of the fermentation time because I didn't have to worry about a diacetyl rest, which was really nice. So once I reached the final gravity and the beer was tasting pretty decent, I put it in the keg and um, I added some biofine to help accelerate the clarification process and then let it lager in my fridge for another week. Once that lagering process had gone on for about a week and some of that residual yeast haze had dropped out, I uh, put it on gas and carbonated it up and got it ready to serve. So the beer is called The Hunt for the Red Oktoberfest and it comes in at 6.1% ABV and 14 IBUs. So for the appearance of the beer, it is pouring a nice amber color. Um, it is pretty much mostly clarified. Unfortunately, there is a little tiny bit of haze left uh, and maybe like 5% overall. That'll drop out within the next few weeks, but I did want to get this video up and ready for you guys sooner rather than later. Um, and also, there's a little bit of humidity outside today, which is kind of hurting the way that this looks on video, I think, when it's... Uh, making some condensation on the glass, but otherwise it's a nice looking beer. It has a really nice tight ivory colored head, uh, sort of off-white head. Uh, sticks around for a little bit and then uh, drops to a small layer, but still has great lacing overall. All right, so let's go in for aroma. So right off the bat, I'm getting a lot of um, very intense maltiness. Uh, really a very, very strong bread crust character, like a dark toasted bread crust character. And then some nice sweet malty edges in there that really kind of convinced me that this is going to be a pretty malty beer when I take a sip of it. Um, yeah, a little tiny whiff of that German lager character as well, which is pretty good. So um, no real discernible hop character though. All right, so now let's go ahead and jump into the mouthfeel. This is not a light-bodied beer by any stretch of the imagination. This is really more of a medium-bodied lager. Um, it's leaving a decent amount of residual sweetness and a little bit of character left behind on the palate. It's not a full-bodied beer either. So uh, this is solidly in that medium category. It's very crisp though and refreshing and highly drinkable. I'm really getting a lot of that classic lager mouthfeel out of this. Just clean, light, crisp and refreshing. Um, but still, you know, with that ample amount of maltiness and residual sugars that are left behind in the Meritzen style, that clean and light character does not leave much behind. So you're really just looking at uh, all of that maltiness coming to the forefront. And that kind of medium final gravity there really does help push that a lot. Um, so yeah, in terms of mouthfeel, I think this really did end up exactly where it needs to be. And um, it's very drinkable. So, in mind, let's go in for flavor. Mm. Yeah, that's pretty good. So the predominant flavor characteristics in this are bread, like a rich breadiness, a toasted bread crust character, and just like a toasty malt uh, overall kind of experience. There's a nice malty sweetness that's there due to the Karamunic one, um, but it's not getting to that like caramel flavor zone that you kind of want to stay out of for, uh, for the traditional Meritzen style. I prefer my Oktoberfest Meritzens as more of a little slightly more sweet character. Uh, this is definitely not as sweet, I think, as I would potentially like it to be, but that's really out of style uh, in most cases, and that's more driven by the American examples of an Oktoberfest Meritzen. So this is really actually a lot closer to what I would consider to be a stylistically appropriate Meritzen with just, just a touch of that sweetness on there, but mostly toast and rich, bready, malty characteristics. Now, of course, there is no decoction character necessarily 
but there's a fair amount of melanoidins in this, and I think that 90 minute boil did really help darken the wort quite a bit. It also helped a lot in terms of generating melanoidins and giving you that kind of deep rich malt complexity. It's definitely not present to the same degree uh, as if I had used a decoction mash or added melanoidin malt deliberately into this. That being said, it is still there and it makes an impact. There's a nice little like uh, honey background note on this as well. That honey sweetness blends in very nicely with the malt character and with that nice little touch of uh, melanoidin sweetness as well. So uh, overall, everything did blend together quite nicely. A little bit of noble hop character at the very end as well. A very slight spice uh, just to complement everything. And then that lager yeast brings it all together. And yes, the Oktoberfest blend did exactly what it was supposed to do. It did not over attenuate like some lager yeasts like W3470, for example, will do that in an, uh, an Oktoberfest beer. This one did not over attenuate, um, leaving a nice residual sweetness there. That also boosts the malt character. It really does get out of the way. There's no real mouthfeel component there. Um, and very, very clean overall, ester-free fermentation. So no diacetyl to be seen anywhere near this. So the ALDC did its job as well. So all in all, just a pretty interesting uh, combined set of effects here from this experiment. Either way though, I'm really happy with the beer. It turned out very, very nicely and it's been a big hit so far with the, everyone who's actually had some. As far as the Blickman Brew Easy Surface Compact goes, well, you're gonna have to wait and find out what my actual feedback on that is when I do an official review video on the system later, but my first impressions are good. Um, I enjoyed the system. It's definitely a very different animal than the claw hammer system that I'm used to, and it definitely comes with some pluses and minuses in many different areas but my overall experience was positive and I'm excited to brew on it again. I'll get a few more brews in on that system before we break it down and actually review it. I'm very happy with the uh, first brew that came off of the system regardless. But anyway guys, if you enjoyed this video, please go ahead and hit that like button and also subscribe if you haven't already. If you enjoyed this video, then odds are you're gonna enjoy the other videos I have on my channel as well, so be sure to check them out. And also comment down below with the rest of your thoughts and everything. Um, have you brewed with Y-Yeast 2633 Oktoberfest blend? What do you think of that yeast if you've used it? If you want to support the channel, please consider picking up a t-shirt like this one or the other designs that I wear on the regular. You can find those in my merchandise store, which is linked in the description box down below. And uh, there's also a Patreon as well. My Patreon supporters have been helping out a ton in terms of upgrading the production quality for this channel over the last several years and just helping out with a lot of important things. So I do really have a big thank you for all of my Patreon supporters and all that you've given over these last several years. But if you want to help support in other ways, there's also the channel memberships option and the super thanks button. Uh, both of those things mean a lot to me if you choose to uh, use either of those things. There's also an Amazon store in the description box with all of my recommended brewing equipment and uh, also my filming equipment if you're curious about all that stuff. I'm also available on Instagram and Facebook uh, as The Apartment Brewer on both of those platforms if you want to check out some more frequent content updates and some various day-to-day -day stuff. Get an idea of what's going to be coming to the channel in the very near future. And last but certainly not least, if you're still here, thank you so much for watching all the way to the end of the video. I know I say this all the time, but these things can get kind of long and I really seriously do appreciate it when you guys stick around and watch the whole thing. It does mean a lot to me. So until the next one, happy Oktoberfest. Prost. Not today, bees.